Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays edition 118. My name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. It's great to be with you today uh, and we've got a, a very interesting subject today, how to achieve a higher score on your GFSI audit. Who doesn't want to do that? You know, if you're getting a B, get up to an A. If you're getting an A, A star or whatever. Uh, we all need to continually improve. So, and that will be with Don Milne from DNVGL Business Assurance. We'll be uh, speaking to Don in a little while. Just to a few housekeeping things. Obviously, some of you already know you're typing in the chat bar. Type in there. Tell us uh, where you're from. Say hello. Uh, it's always nice to hear from you. Um, it is being recorded today. Um, we follow up with an email to all registrants afterwards with the slides, um, the recording of today's webinar, and also your certificate of attendance. Uh, so if you miss a little bit, get caught, called away, don't worry. Um, you can catch up later because it is recorded. Um, just to say the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored, um, help to bring these uh, short bursts of education to you free of charge with a free certificate of attendance but yeah it's thanks to our kind sponsors and i'm going to play their adverts so i'll be back in a couple of minutes The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Wow. Thanks to our sponsors. Very professional, eh? Don't you think, ladies and gents? Um, okay. At this point, I'd like to introduce you to today's guest presenter, Don Milne um, from DMVGL Business Assurance. Are you there, Don? If you can switch your webcam on. Yes, there I am, uh, live from Houston, Texas. <laughs> good morning, Don. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Very, very good. How are you, Simon? Uh, I'm great, thanks. You've been having a bit of wet weather there in Houston, haven't you? Yeah, very, very severe weather conditions at the moment. Several inches of rain over the last couple of days with more more on the way for the weekend. And I see there's quite a few people from the southern states, uh, the Carolinas and so forth, are joining us today. So 
Uh, as it passes over Texas, it's he heading in their direction. Everyone knows that from the, the news and the weather forecast. So we're all just trying to keep keep dry. Yeah, try and keep dry just for the next, at least for the next <laughs> 50 minutes or so. Okay, uh, Don, I'll get your slides up and then uh, we'll get cracking with the presentation. Okay, okay, I'll switch my camera off. Yeah. Okay, I'll be back for the Q&A later, but for now I'll hand you over to Don. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Well, it's morning for me anyway. I know people are coming from uh, all parts of the globe to join in, and I'd like to thank everyone for that. And uh, as I just mentioned, I'm a full-time food safety auditor with DNVGL, and I'm based right here in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, which happens to also be the corporate location of DNV for the Americas. Uh, we are a company based in Norway and a very old established company. And uh, that's what I do. I, I do food safety audits, principally FSSC, uh, although I am also uh, qualified for other standards such as BRC and general standards such as 9001. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about DNV in general. And then I'm going to head into the topic of the day, which is how to improve your audit score. And what I've done, I've taken uh, findings. I had a long look at audits I've done over the last several years, and I looked for common reoccurring themes. And what I've done, I've tried to put together a list of about 15 or 20 uh, tips uh, to share with you to, to just show you that um, – you know, these are common things. Some of them are not very complicated and some of them are quite obvious. But nevertheless, uh, time after time, uh, big and small companies alike uh, fall a little bit flat on some of these things. And by uh, paying attention and, as they say, forewarned is prepared, maybe it will help you improve your score, which is the objective. So let me lead on to a little bit of background about DNV. So we are, in fact, one of the world's leading certification bodies, and the company was founded uh, way back in the 18th uh, century, 1864. Um, it's now a truly global company. As I mentioned, we, we were founded in, uh, in Norway, and that's still where the corporate office is. Um, we now employ over 12,500 employees around the world, uh, and, in fact, we have – uh, customers in 187 countries. So it's a truly global company. We have over 70,000 customers. Um, we have um, over 80,000 certificates issued, not only for food, but for general management system, 9,001, 14,000 series, 18,000, et cetera, et cetera. And food and beverage, of which I'm a part, we have 10,000 uh, companies have partnered with us. It's an astonishing amount when when you think of it that way, 10,000 companies. Uh, as I mentioned, because we're involved in multiple facets, it's not just food and beverage, but other other areas as well, such as healthcare. And that's why it mentions there there's 2,400 healthcare organizations as well that uh, trust us to help them uh, improve quality and patient safety. So, here we are worldwide, and we have around 3,000 auditors, <clears throat> of which, uh, as you'd imagine, for a company founded in Europe, uh, the majority of our uh, audit activity is in Europe. But nevertheless, we are fairly strong in the Americas, uh, particularly, of course, United States, Canada, Mexico, and some of the bigger countries in South America. But we have a team of uh, 500 auditors, which is, is fairly significant. Um, and um, most of the auditors are, are full-time employees with uh, some uh, contract auditors as well, particularly in a, maybe in areas, re remoter areas where there's not quite so much activity. So a couple of things we're doing very quickly uh, within DNV, and we're in fact one of the first companies – to adopt the blockchain technology. In fact, we are the first company within our industry. Um, what is this blockchain? Well, actually, it's, it's a means of readily accessing certificates, but it's also a means of validating that if a supplier gives you a certificate, uh, 
you know, I won't say that it happens all the time, but I mean, there is always a risk. Is it a valid certificate? Had it expired? Had it been changed to make it look a bit better than it really was? Um, you know, did they even have the audit and the certificate in the first place? And obviously, um, you know, these types of situations may be more prevalent in different parts of the world. But nevertheless, it's a worldwide uh, type situation. And so all of our business assurance certificates will be given a unique ID and stored in blockchain. Um, blockchain effectively blocks counterfeit certificates. You can instantly verify, and in fact, anyone can verify the validity of the certificate and view the latest information through a QR co code. You can then email your PDF certificates to stakeholders and so on and so on. Um, the um, validity can be checked in two ways. You can do it with a mobile scanner uh, just on your cell phone or search on a public site. So it's a pretty interesting and uh, innovative new approach to try and ensure authenticity. And I think it'll be very commonplace as we move, move ahead. OK, the next thing, and then we'll get into the main nuts and bolts of, of the uh, today's subject and that's that there's another very interesting concept, and that's virtual audits. And in fact, um, I don't need to really tell you the advantages of this. It would certainly reduce cost. It would reduce all the travel time. Um, it would reduce safety risks of traveling during severe weather conditions and, uh, you know, just having to rent cars, driving in addition to flying to get to the audit site. That in itself helps reduce environmental impact. Uh, you can have multi parties simultaneously involved. So corporate office can be involved with the site and uh, the whole thing can improve the, the planning and the flexibility. So, of course, it sounds a little bit, um, you know, far out to think that we're going to be able to do a virtual audit. And it's not to say that every audit may be virtual, but certainly uh, this is the way that we're looking at and we're piloting this with a couple of very big companies at the moment doing trials to, uh, you know, just see exactly how it works and look for uh, means to get the thing into mainstream acceptance. So that's something to look out for in the future. So we're going to go on to the main part of today's talk, which is uh, tips from me based on actual audits on how you can uh, try and improve your audit score. Because I first and foremost do FSSC audits, um, I've looked back through my uh, notes and found real examples to use for this. But the fact is, is that most of the GFSI audits have all got very, very similar requirements. And so it doesn't really matter what standard you are. These tips should be applicable. You look through your standard and see the specific requirement and how this could perhaps help you. So let's start here. Um, you know, one of the uh, clauses in any audit is control of documents and control of records. And uh, we sit in the office and we look at this and we've got a nice master list of documents and everything looks um, very nicely managed and controlled. So generally, uh, we don't find the problem sitting in the office, but where I found problems at plant level is you go out in the plant and, uh, you know, all plants are different, but some plants have control rooms or, you know, an operator office where they sit and maintain their records and update things like that. And it's fairly common, and this happened in some big companies as well I've been to, that uh, in the office you find a bookcase or some shelves or something like that, and lo and behold, there's a bunch of obsolete instruction manuals and operator guidelines that have been there who knows how long, kind of uh, out of daily use, you know, out of mind. And you say, well, wait a minute, what are these? Oh, well, don't worry about those. You know, we don't use them anymore. But the fact of the matter is, is that somebody could use it. You've put it there as an instruction manual. You know, somebody could pick it up and say, well, I'm going to do what it says in here. Um, this tends to be particularly where you have fairly large items of equipment, maybe a spray dryer, um, bank of centrifuges. Um, 
this type of equipment, vacuum evaporators, where the manufacturers, when they originally installed it, gave you detailed uh, manuals. Of course, over the years, this equipment may have been subject to various modifications and changes. That manual might not even be applicable if you wanted it to be. In some extreme cases, the companies have changed hands once or twice, and the manual doesn't even refer to the right company anymore. It's the old company from you know, one or two owners ago. So please have a good look around and anything which you feel you need, correctly archive it and mark it obsolete and keep it somewhere where it cannot inadvertently be used. So um, we then get onto records again within the plant environment. And, uh, you know, those of you that probably um, have a 9001 or have been familiar with the ISO series uh, or, or any audit really know that uh, records must uh, hand um, completed records must be correctly filled out. And quite often an operator makes a mistake. He writes something in and it's wrong. And so that's OK. We know that people do make mistakes. The correct way to address that is by single strike through the original entry and initial it. That way you can see the original uh, figure uh, or entry and uh, we know who did it. And, you know, we can ask people, why, why did you change that? What we unfortunately find is somebody is obliterated out with a ballpoint pen, so you can't see the original uh, entry and in, in, even, you know, haven't even bothered initialing it. So the standard does say records must remain legible, and, of course, this makes it completely illegible. So small point, but have a look through uh, manually completed records, and if you find there are lots of corrections in it, that itself should trigger some kind of internal review of why are we having to change things so much, you know? Uh, is it just operators are careless in transcribing, or, or in fact, is it uh, are they testing it twice and getting a different result? I mean, all these things uh, should trigger a little bit of an alarm bell. So there's a couple of other points on, on similar theme, which... Um, I didn't type in here, but I'm going to, to mention it. And that's that sometimes um, operators add information to a controlled record. Uh, so, you know, it's a controlled document. It becomes a record as it's completed, of course. But maybe there was a column that somebody's added in and you find, you know, an, a penciled in extra column with some additional information. And, uh, you know, giving the time or something that somebody felt they needed to add. Look, if we need that information that the original document must be modified accordingly, you know, it's not uh, acceptable that plant operators add or omit things to an official controlled document. So uh, please be aware of that. I have seen it fairly often. And the other thing is, is operators using unofficial notepads or pieces of paper and developing their own uh, little records. But in fact, they're not really records because they're not maintained or filed. Uh, an example is somebody feels like they need a tally sheet. The company doesn't have one. So somebody draws it up, photocopies it, and you find everyone's filling that out. And so you go around with the quality team and you say, what about this record? And the answer is sometimes, well, that's not actually a record. It's just unofficial. You know, it's just the operator's notes. Well, the thing is, if it's in a plant environment and it's being completed by the operators and it is related to your product or production, it has to be official. And if you were unfortunate enough to suffer a serious situation, perhaps even a recall in worst case scenario, all of these records would be examined and it wouldn't um, be very convincing to say, well, you know, these are just unofficial operator ones. If, if it's needed, please develop your own one and control it by the normal method. OK, food safety objectives. And, you know, everyone has a food safety policy and we are required to put measurable objectives associated with that food safety policy. And this seems to be an area that 
quite a few companies struggle with. And I've had all sorts of answers when I say, what are your food safety objectives? And usually, uh, you know, there may be some food safety ones uh, that I can dig out, but often they're not very clearly defined. So what would be a good valid food safety objective? Well, it could be customer complaint level would be, you know, very valid for, for a food safety objective. It could be your response time to a customer complaint. It could be right first time would be a valid food safety objective. It could be no recall as an objective. And other plants have said to me, well, no recall, that's, that's a silly objective. Of course, we don't want to recall. Well, we know that, but I've got to tell you that some of the biggest food manufacturers in the world have that. No recall or no serious food safety um, issues as an objective. So those type of things are clear and should be well communicated throughout the plant so that uh, everybody, you know, from the, the most humble of positions up to the top should be aware of those four or five objectives or however many you've decided are relevant for your um, for your situation. So. Um, Ones that I've seen that get presented as, well, here's one. Um, the, the one which absolutely didn't fit the bill was the plant that told me uh, our main objective is to make a profit. Well, we know that. That's why we're in business when we don't apologize for that. But it's not a food safety objective. Um, other plants put down things like no more than three miners uh, in a GFSI audit, in an external audit. So you ask yourself, well, why would three be good and four not be good? Um, you know, I don't personally think that, you know, attributing arbitrarily attributing a number of non-conformances is really a food safety objective. Uh, we know that sometimes these things get linked to a bonus or incentive schemes as well. And, uh, you know, it can be a very big deal getting non-conformances. And so I understand people maybe put this in as a uh, something to focus everybody and try and make them pay particular attention to. But it's not really a true food safety objective. And other ones are things like OSHA objectives for safety, safety of, of people and personnel. And obviously that's very, very important. But again, that is not a food safety objective. Neither is a financial objective a food safety objective so have a look at your objectives because i do find this is quite weak in some surprisingly big companies that uh, it could be uh, focused a little bit more and improved upon okay flow diagrams and you'll have to excuse the example that's not really a example of a flow diagram in the food industry but it was just put in for illustration so what is the problem that we often find? Flow diagrams missing inputs and outputs and particularly utilities. I'll give you an example. You could have a large spray dryer and an input to it is air. The air is uh, sucked in. There's a huge fan uh, blowing the air through the spray dryer. It's heating. Uh, it's acting as a conveyancing medium for the powder. Uh, it's also indirect food product contact. So that air intake, A, has to show up on your flow diagram and B, has to be controlled. Usually there'd be a filter on it. And sometimes this type of input completely gets omitted from the flow diagram. And when you ask, you know, do you have an air intake filter? Uh, yeah, I think so. We'll, let's call the maintenance department. They probably deal with that. Well, folks, this would be a control point that has to be contemplated in the flow diagram you have to define how you manage that risk of sucking in uh, a foreign material into uh, that could mix with your product and so if you do have a filter those type of things need to be listed with limits on uh, the filter defined in terms of maybe the micron size and the frequency of change and the monitoring other inputs which sometimes get omitted are steam uh, water air, vacuum, all of those things definitely you need to have on your flow diagram. And at the same time, you need to look that outputs are included. Condensate 
rework the inedible waste and have a look at it so within your own plant uh, you make it very plant specific which of course is what it's supposed to be and the standards usually require you do a plant walkthrough to verify that flow chart that is a very very good exercise uh, so you go through and what may have been missed in the office drawing this up as a chart could well be detected as you go through the plant and do the verification of that flow chart. OK, internal audit. Now, this is an interesting subject because virtually all plants have an internal audit program. Um, but what I find is, is that the focus of the internal audit is often been kind of um, defaulted to GMPs. You know, it's a kind of housekeeping audit, maybe with a few other things that got added on. Maybe they said glass and brittle plastic. Yeah, we can add that to our audit. So oftentimes it doesn't look at the whole food safety system. So you really need to look at your internal audit um, in terms of, yes, we have an element which is GMPs or prerequisite programs, but we also have the overall system that we should be looking at the effectiveness of this. Remember that internal audit is uh, one of the principal means of, um, of uh, verification and validation of your system. So uh, one of the problems we get is that internal audits you get in a large plant, you may have a lot of auditors have been trained. You may find you've got an audit team of 30 or 40 auditors or more. And so the internal audit gets broken down into uh, manageable elements or modules, which I think is a good idea. Rather than one massive audit, it gets broken down into monthly audits. So audit team A do this part of the plant, audit team B do that, and so on and so on throughout the year hopefully covering all of the elements that you've decided should be audited. Um, what we find is, is that often the audit team <clears throat> has not had a lot of detailed training. And in particular, uh, I think it's very valuable to train your audit team on how to grade findings. So again, I'm going to use FSSC. We now have critical findings. We have major we have minor and that old uh, chestnut observations has, in fact, gone away. Why do I say that? Because observations are always or oftentimes that borderline situation where you look at it one way. Yeah, it's kind of nearly a nonconformance. You look at it the other way. Well, maybe it is a minor. Uh, it's a little bit ambiguous. And one of the problems is that led to it being eliminated is that it was often seen as soft grading. And when our audit findings go for technical review within DNV, the reviewer would often say, well, wait a minute, why did you say that's an observation? The way you've written it is it's actually a minor nonconformance. So the standard doesn't allow an observation. Now, that doesn't mean that you as the plant cannot have observations. You can structure your internal audit how you like and it's perfectly fine that you have um, observations included in that but we know that an observation usually doesn't require corrective action it can be fixed with a correction and so there's a temptation to rate everything from your internal audit as it was just an observation and so at the end of this you say okay um, let's have a look at your audit findings and you find that there's very, very limited corrective actions. Now, we know that corrective actions include root cause, and it's a means of drilling down and getting to the root of the problem. And if you don't do that, it's often you find that all of these multiple audits end up with repetitive findings month after month. Oh, this wasn't cleaned again. That wasn't done. We spoke again to the operator. Uh, it should be better next month, but unfortunately, we find all too often it wasn't better. So uh, I have also would suggest if you have these multiple audits, you pull it all together into one summary audit report. Uh, very convenient 
to do with your management review on an annual basis or however frequently you do that. But it can be time wasting and uh, difficult to capture the essence of things in an audit where uh, you get presented with 40 different uh, examples of, well, this was, you know, the warehouse audit. Oh, this was the, uh, you know, yard. This was the um, GMP area and so on and so on. So try and summarize them in some kind of concise method which facilitates uh, the audit. And also it focuses the the team on how you're going to deal with repetitive findings. Um, I visited one plant that as a result of this type of situation, they had over 260 findings for the year. And I finished my audit and I, in fact, had found, you know, I can't remember exactly, but maybe five or six findings. And the plant were absolutely distraught, you know, we, but we have a target not to have more than three findings. So I said, but how do you yourself find 260? And I find half a dozen and everyone's unhappy, you know, what, where is the disconnect in that situation? So have a think about that. Have a look at your internal audit program and see if maybe you're falling into that uh, pitfall that I've just described. But internal audit is something that I find uh, repeatedly fairly weak and, uh, you know, requires digging quite deeply to get to it to make sure that people are, in fact, in compliance with the standard. OK, corrective actions. And again, really, I've just talked about that, but you know, use them as appropriate in addition to corrections. And, you know, evidence should be available during an external audit. Uh, I will always uh, be asking to see your corrective action log and evidence that things were uh, A, corrected, uh, B, that root cause was done, and that follow-up, you know, they were assigned to somebody. It was followed up within a realistic time period um, and, uh, you know, you yourself can decide uh, what kind of time period uh, you think should be realistic to complete this process. But again, be guided by the standard you're working to. You know, if the standard has major and minor categories and, you know, some must be minors must be completed within 90 days, make sure you get your correction done. But I certainly wouldn't expect to find a plant open corrective action that exceeds the limit that the standard puts on it. And obviously a major, you need to jump on that, uh, get the correction done straight away and get it fixed within 14 days. So here's another thing that quite common, uh, temporary repairs. And we all know things break and get broken and we have to keep the plant running. You may have a lot of product which um, has to be packed uh, for example, and you can't leave it overnight while you fix a machine. So we do a temporary repair, try and keep everything running until such time we can make it a permanent repair. So what are the ground rules that I apply for temporary repairs? Firstly, it should have been reported to the line supervisor and the maintenance department, and both of those um, entities should be involved in the temporary repair, even minor stuff. What I mean is not some kind of ad hoc operator repair. And, you know, hopefully there's no examples in the plants that you work in, but I've seen lots of them. You know, somebody has taped um, cardboard boxes around a metal leg on a machine because they have to stand and look at uh, maybe the metal detector and that you know metal leg of the machine bumps your knee and it's painful so oh well a good way around that we'll just tape you know several layers of cardboard around it and pad it that's what i call an ad hoc operator repair no one is going to approve that it's something the operator did so to convince me that it is temporary there should be a work order submitted as well so it's been written down and the work order is in and what does that mean? It's a temporary repair until you have the first opportunity to make it permanent. OK, and um, that should be as soon as practical. Now, we know that there are situations where you need to get maybe a spare part. It may be an imported machine. It may not be as quick as just an off the shelf part. 
that you carry in stock at the plant. So, you know, I try and be pragmatic about that, but it certainly uh, we have to look at it in terms of food safety. And if it's a temporary repair, there should be no hazards associated with that repair while you're trying to get it fixed properly. Tape, because we often find tape is a marvelous uh, fix it all, right? We just wrap it up in layers of sticky tape. And if it happens that you have to use tape for some reason, it should definitely not be in product contact and replace it frequently. You know, don't leave it there to accumulate residues could be, you know, tape is notorious for a, a micro hazard, you know, trapping moisture or, or product or something in it. And tape really is a last resort. Again, not in product contact, please. And avoid cardboard. I just mentioned an example where somebody may wrap it around a part of the structure of the machine. But, you know, I've found cardboard being used um, as a diverter on a powder hopper because for some reason, you know, uh, when they filled the bags, the, the, there was some powder escaping. And so uh, very ingeniously, the operators created a, a little extension on the chute using some cardboard. Um, how these things go unnoticed in plant level is beyond me, to be honest, because uh, when I walk in, it just seems to uh, stare me in the face. But nevertheless, um, you may find examples of it. And I think one of the things is speak to the operators that they are aware of this. Hey, we know you're trying to help, but, uh, you know, it's it has to be reported and everybody has to be on board with it. OK. Next thing, we're going to talk about glass and brittle plastic. And again, that leads on a little bit from temporary repairs. And I'm sure a lot of you have got plants with various uh, packing machines, um, filling machines and so forth, which uh, these days for safety reasons and, you know, to try and minimize product exposure, they have plexiglass guards or shields which is wonderful. The best stuff in the world is plexiglass. We can see through it and it looks great. Uh, the only thing is it's subject to frequent removal and reinstallation, maybe for cleaning or to access the piece of equipment. And so unfortunately, it can be relatively easy to crack. Maybe, um, you know, there are bolts hold it in place and over tightening of bolts can create a crack or it's supposed to have maybe some kind of large, a washer, I know we don't want small washers that may fall in the product, but maybe some large metal circle that spreads the uh, the tension or the load on those shields has gone missing. And so what do we get? We get a crack in a shield. And worse still, sometimes we get missing pieces. So I generally ask, well, you know, when did it crack? And often people all look a little bit blank as well. It's been like that for quite a while. Where did the missing piece go? And again, nobody's really sure. So what does it mean? Um, it's really only getting inspected during your glass brittle plastic audit, which in some plants is only done maybe um, once a year. You know, it's not enough when you're stripping these pieces of equipment down every day. So please um, check them carefully when you do, maybe you do a pre-op inspection that the equipment's clean include those shields for any damages or cracks and immediately report them now i know that some of these shields are very very expensive they may have to be imported if they're kind of molded as a special shape or design and so it's not very pleasant to have to replace these things but the operators of the cleaning crew need to report any damage immediately and if it is going to be some time before you can get a replacement shield in, at least weigh up the risk. It's up to you to do the risk assessment. Is any plastic likely to fall off and pose a direct hazard into the food as a physical hazard? Um, at very minimum, I would expect somebody to mark the crack, you know, perhaps with a marker pen or and the date and say that that was the crack at this date. We're ordering a new one. We can then look at it every day and see if it seems to be getting worse and developing into something that could be a risk. OK, so chemical storage, uncontrolled chemicals in the plant. Uh, chemicals are supposed to be locked. Um, 
what is the risk here? We have uh, chemicals as a chemical hazard. Um, you know, there's only really three types of chemicals in food, and that's naturally occurring. Ones we add uh, purposely, which could be a preservative perhaps, and ones which are inadvertently added. So what we're trying to do here is prevent inadvertent addition or even worse, malicious addition. I haven't listed it as a food defense item, but, you know, this is a risk. Some disgruntled person can see some chemical laying there. There's no access control. It could be not beyond imagination that somebody could being uh, bad intentioned add it to your product. So it's got to be locked, posted and authorized access only. So people say, well, Don, that's not practical because, you know, we need this stuff all the time. We need frequent access. Well, we know that. But nevertheless, the standard requires it and good management, good GMP requires that these are controlled and restricted access. So, uh, you know, you have to decide how you do that. But the best way is locking it up. So then as a follow on from that, we sometimes get spray bottles or containers in a plant that are not marked. And it could be that your cleaning chemical is in a big drum, you know, which is laying on a frame within the chemical cage. And of course, you can't bring a drum into the plant. So what do you do? You decant it into a jug or a bucket or something. Unfortunately, sometimes those containers are not marked and it ends up in the plant. The other culprit is spray bottles, which may have a sanitizer uh, or whatever uh, in the spray bottle, but that's perfectly okay, but it has to be clearly identified and even better should have a date on, you know, when was that bottle filled up and what, what is in it. So again, fairly common fail point, chemical storage, uncontrolled chemicals. Watch out for those spray bottles. Okay, reagents. Um, not applicable to all plants, but quite a lot of plants have got a little mini lab or a test area. And, you know, uh, you might be doing pH or something like that, or maybe it's for testing of uh, sanitizer strength, uh, things like that. Uh, so, again, reagents have to be clearly marked with expiry dates on. And often, you know, this seems to be a little area which, it's not quite under control of the lab. It doesn't seem like it's quite un, under control of the production people. It's a kind of no man's land and very common to find reagents uh, with expiry dates on or unmarked reagents. And people say, well, you know, that's uh, phenolphthalein or whatever the reagent is. And uh, we get it every day from the lab. So we know it's fresh. Well, you might know that, but I don't know that. And as an auditor, I'd like to see that evidence. So make sure they're marked with expiry dates. Boiler chemical test kits, another uh, thing which tends to fall between maintenance shop and often out of sight and out of mind from the food safety team. Boiler chemicals have to be, um, uh, you know, food food grade, of course, uh, which means they're safe for incidental food contact. Now, what does it mean they're safe at the recommended dose? It's like anything else. If you put uh, nitrates or nitrites in food, it has to be at a certain level. You can't just add as much as you feel fit. Same with the boiler chemical. Uh, and when you ask, you know, you're testing your boiler um, water, yes, why do you test it? Usually people would say, ah, well, uh, let's ask the maintenance guy. And the maintenance guy will very proudly tell you, well, it's to make sure we don't scale up the boiler. And yeah, that's that's in fact a very valid reason. But in fact, we need to make sure we're not overdosing because that could inadvertently lead to excess chemicals making its way in steam, which may or may not be in direct food contact. So very common to find a very rundown little corner of the boiler room, which is usually a fairly dusty, dirty environment with a test kit with reagents that expired three years ago. And, uh, you know, no one's sure where the records are. It's all very ad hoc written on bits of paper. So to do take a look at that forgotten area, which is boiler, boiler uh, maintenance and management. Simple stuff here, but nevertheless, uh, very common. Fail points, um, warehousing, dust not controlled. Now, obviously, the best way to do this is try and control the dust. 
But we know in some areas of the country, dust, it's a dusty environment. And, you know, despite good management of the warehouse, good cleaning programs, we still find with all our best efforts, some dust or small debris on top of ingredients and finished goods. This is why ingredients, it's important you've got plastic sheet over them. So if you do get dust and bits and pieces, at least it's not on the box, which you're then going to open and some of that dust or whatever particles may unfortunately find their way into your mix. So finished goods, uh, well, you know, they're already closed in a sealed box, but you need to look at how you control it. And a lot of plants tell me, well, we clean them off before we load uh, the truck, you know. Oh, how do you do that? Well, uh, we blow it off with air. And so that's that's good. And then you say, well, let's just go and have a look how you do that. Is there a procedure for it? And usually the answer is no. So, you know, that would be useful that at least it's described somewhere. And, you know, the operators uh, or the loaders know exactly what's required of them. Um, some kind of, um, you know, blowgun available to actually do this uh, step, which everyone thinks is being done, which often isn't done. I would say that's really a second defense because the main objective should be to try and control the dust in the warehouse in the first instance. But, you know, at least uh, something like that would show that there is some uh, defense mechanism has been put in place. And again, um, you know, the bane of every warehouse manager is the roll up doors and the dock plates. And we all know, you know, they get bumped, they get twisted trucks bang into them, forklift trucks bang into them. You get damaged seals, misaligned doors, dock plates not properly adjusted. So, you know, there's a gap under or the dock plate comes up a little high and holds the door maybe half an inch or an inch off the ground. And that leads you to have, uh, you know, uh, pest access. Take a look at nighttime uh, with the lights on in the warehouse and you outside and you'll soon see any problem areas. Yard area, uh, we've got to move quickly to leave some time for question and answers. Uh, pest harborage, be careful. Something that gets overlooked often is plants that use a lot of piping, uh, either for product or, you know, whatever. There's plastic pipe stocks and steel pipe stocks. When you get them, they're all sealed. They've got a cap on the end. Of course, the cap usually gets taken off because somebody cuts a piece of pipe off and it then gets put in the yard just in a rack or even worse on the ground. So make sure it doesn't result in a nice little convenient hidey hole for pests. So if you can't reseal it, I'm sure the maintenance shop will tell you uh, it's not practical to reseal. All those pipes will be there all forever. If they can't do that and you can't insist they do it, at least make sure when you do your outside walk around or your pest control visit that that's an area which gets included. Employee facilities, I think this is the last slide. And surprisingly enough, toilets opening directly onto a production area. Uh, FSSC is very clear about that and so are most standards that you're not allowed to have that. Even a simple restaurant, a fast food restaurant is not allowed that. So you're supposed to have a vestibule, maybe a secondary door. Um, some standards allow the use of an air curtain to mitigate that risk. You'd have to check whatever standard you're certified to and see what is applicable. But having not seen this uh, for several years, I've suddenly come across three plants that all had a toilet opening into a production or a warehouse area with no kind of containment. Um, the other thing is hand wash sinks with hand operated faucets. Uh, this has largely gone away, uh, should be indirectly controlled, you know, with a sensor like you just put your hand in front, the water comes on. Or the older school foot pedal would be just fine. But there are still plants that have hand operated faucets and that can result in a minor nonconformance. So um, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, I think we're going to uh, hand back over now to Simon and we'll look at some question and answers. I'll turn my camera on again now. OK, thank you, Don. Um, so let me get rid of the presentation. That was great. Uh, yeah. Lots of great practical uh, insight there. Real life insight as well from a, from an auditor. Yeah. Um, OK. There's been lots of uh, comments 
throughout. I'll just, uh, I, I have highlighted some. Um, could you, uh, first one, um, Sarah Jo, um, could you clarify a food safety objective and, and give give a, a an example of a f or a couple of examples of food safety objectives? Yeah, sure. Um, again, like I say, this is an area which um, <clears throat> a lot of people struggle to come up with a food safety objective, and so they end up putting in things like. Um, no lost time injuries. Well, that's a great objective, but it's it's under safety for uh, human and, and health. And it's equally important, but it's not your food safety objective. So food safety would be anything which is really, um, you know, could pose a risk to food safety. You should be monitoring it. And that's why we set measurable objectives. You've got to be able to measure it. A great one is your customer complaint level. This is telling us, you know, do we have problems? Complaints should be categorized in quality and safety. And, you know, if you start getting in food safety complaints, you've definitely got a problem. You've got bad product going out the door. You're, you're heading for a recall. So, I mean, you must really have a, a key objective should be no food safety um, complaints. You know, uh, it's not OK to say less than five or something, you know, quality complaints. Yes, you can put a number on it. Um, no recall, I mentioned that, could be a great objective. Some of the biggest companies on the planet, food companies, have that because it's about the worst thing can happen to any food company. You get a recall. If you're a small company, it can break you. So, uh, you know, these are things that are not always obvious, but um, customer complaint level, um, no recall. Um, please don't use the one of, oh, no more than six minors during our GFSI audit. I don't think that's valid. You know, uh, mm. six would be good, seven would be bad. I don't follow any logic to that whatsoever. Okay, okay, thanks, uh, Don. Amanda, what is best practice for the frequency of checking the HACCP flowchart against the plant process? Well, that's a great question. The first thing is when you draw up the flow chart in the first instance, you have to go through and check it in the plant in real life conditions. OK, so when would we need to recheck it? Well, the simple answer would be when you change something. So if there's a change to the process flow, you've put in maybe a new filler or a new machine or an X-ray or something. So something has changed that requires you to redraw that flow chart you have to go out and recheck it okay i would say if you think nothing's changed a minimum of once a year would be a good frequency and that could be that there was no inadvertent change you know the maintenance shop changed some pipe work for some reason or the sanitation crew asked for some changes and uh, maybe there were things that affect the flow diagram so routinely annually but uh keep in mind any changes go and check it at that time okay great uh sarah sarah can you clarify the difference between corrections and corrective actions yeah sure that's a great question as well which there's a lot of confusion about okay a correction is you do something that corrects the situation okay i'll give you a ridiculously simple example we see a paper towel on the floor. We pick it up. It's been corrected. OK, you go through the plant. You find paper towels everywhere. Every hand wash basin has towels laying on the floor and, you know, uh, just out of control situation. You say, well, wait a minute. There's some reason for this. What is the reason? Maybe we need a, a new type of trash receptacle or something. So you do a corrective action. You do what is the root cause of all of these paper towels? all over the place and then you take actions which fixes it so a correction is just simply correcting the situation and any uh, situation uh, needs correction straight away I mean if you find even a serious situation first thing you've got to do is correct it get it back under control and then you do your corrective action make sure that it's not going to repeat as far as you can prevent that okay great Yep. Uh, yes, good. Jonathan, could you please provide information about how you categorize findings into majors and minors with examples? Yeah, sure. 
Easy. That's what I do every day. So a major. Don't forget, we've got a critical now. And so I'm going to tell you about that. First of all, a critical is something which um, is there's an absolute blatant disregard for food safety or you're actually breaking the law. What could an example be? Chickens returned from a grocery retailer that has returned for disposal, for disposition. The plant has agreed to take them back because they will uh, dispose of them in a responsible manner. If they were to just rip the packaging open, uh, give them a wash in a chlorine bath or something, repack them and send them out, that would be a critical nonconformance. You know, certificate would be suspended. Uh, if the authorities saw that, the plant would be shut down. So then we go to a major. A major is usually a situation where there is an element of the standard that you haven't addressed. And with FSSC, there's been some new requirements with version 4.1. One of them was to develop a food fraud plan. And uh, not so much this year because we're in the second year of it. But the first year, it was fairly commonplace to find people just said, you know, uh, we haven't done it. We're not sure how to do it. And we've been trying to think about it, but we didn't do it. OK, if there's an element that you haven't done, it's a major nonconformance. OK, a minor is exactly what it says. It's a minor situation where uh, you do have things in place. You know, you had, um, you know, all your documented procedures or something, maybe there was a lapse and you found there's a form not being signed or filled out or, hey, a guy just walked past without his beard net on, you know, or hair net. But the systems are all in place. It's just a lapse. And so we say, hey, it shouldn't be happening. It's a minor. But I will caution you, if you find enough of the same situations, if we were to find 20 people without their hair nets and beard nets on, we'd say, yes, whilst it's a uh, minor in nature because it's repetitive and widespread throughout the plant i'm going to avail i'm going to elevate that to a major now the last category i'll tell you is a minor which uh, was raised during an audit and uh, you know i don't know let me just think of an example there was a deteriorated floor which made cleaning uh, uh, difficult you know it's not uh, major at this stage, but it deteriorates much more. It could be. I'm going to give you a minor nonconformance, get the floor fixed. The plant sends you their corrective action plan and they say, yes, we're going to get it epoxy painted by the 1st of June. It will all be taken care of. The auditor goes next year. Lo and behold, oh, we couldn't do it because, you know, the budget got cut or, you know, we ran out of epoxy paint or some other arbitrary reason. If you did not uh, follow through on your corrective action plan to address a minor, it will be elevated to a major at the next audit and you have 14 days in which to deal with it. Usually a major will require a repeat visit from the auditor to see evidence that you've done it. So you're letting yourself in for a lot of extra expense and time and heartache. So please do make sure that you follow through because the way it works, the auditor will accept the corrective action plan that's sent to you after the audit but it gets closed at the following year's audit. Okay, clear. Thank you. Uh, Monica, just a uh, comment from Monica, just sharing. One of our objectives was to achieve above 95% score on daily GMP inspections by supervisor and QA. Is that a, a reasonable objective? Well, you know, it's up to you to see what the 5% that you didn't achieve were. You know, it's a bit like the advert for bleach. It kills 99% of all known germs. Well, it's the 1% that kills you, you know, not the 95%. <laughs> so I would look at them and say, what was the 5% nonconformance? What was it actually? Was there any risk associated with food safety from that 5%? So I think it requires a case-by-case -case look at it rather than just to say, hey, you know, uh, 95 good, uh, 94 uh, no good kind of thing. And also, if it, like you say, if it repeats, if it's the same thing yeah. that repeats on every audit, then it's something's not fundamentally yeah, not then right. Yeah, you need to do root cause, not just a correction. Um, Jonathan, you mentioned authorised personnel. How, how is this defined? What evidence might be required for proof of authorisation? Well, that's a great question as well. I, I would imagine we're talking about for 
chemicals, right? And um, as I mentioned, you've got cleaning chemicals. You've also got chemicals that you may be adding uh, deliberately to the mix, preservatives, um, maybe anti-foam or something into uh, liquid, you know, that's prone to foaming. So the easy way to do that would be to develop, firstly, a written procedure, uh, go through that procedure with those personnel, use of the chemical, and uh, do a simple test. The easiest way is develop a test with four or five questions to make sure everybody understands it. The people that have had that training and done the test are then authorized. You can then just draw up a simple list, which you can show an auditor. This is our authorized usage personnel for all chemicals in the plant. Okay, good. Uh, Trish, um, waste dumpsters, should they be covered at all times? Well, Again, you know, it depends on the nature of your waste. I mean, if it's cardboard waste or something, is there any real risk that it's not covered? But in general, if it's covered, what does it do? It prevents pest access to some degree. It prevents, you know, birds flying down and trying to swoop stuff out of the dumpster. Um, and, you know, it, uh, I think it, it looks neater and tidier. So, Again, I would say, really, you have to look at the risks associated with your waste and you decide. But more and more commonplace, most of the uh, certainly things for inedible or something, yeah, I would make sure they're covered. Um, you know, if you've got a scrap steel dumpster that the, the maintenance shop are using, I don't think you need to cover that. Um Mm, I'm not sure. It's it's a simple question, but it might be a difficult answer. I don't know. Hamid, how can I perform a simple environmental protection plan for, for a food plant? Well, I would imagine that we're talking about environmental monitoring, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> and if we're talking about, I mean, environmental protection, that could mean what are we trying to protect the environment? I don't think that that's what we're, we're really asking. So I'm going to interpret this as an environmental protection plan. So you have to look at it in terms of the area. If you've got anything that's a high risk area, in other words, you're maybe uh, doing ready to eat, uh, you know, you definitely need to be considering environmental risks. And this would, okay, apart from controlling the atmosphere in terms of the air in the room, you probably need air filtration. You may have positive pressure in that room that uh, so the uh, dust doesn't flow in. It encourages dust to move out, you know, um, but it would usually involve swabbing. And you'd be looking at the environmental pathogens, principally salmonella, listeria, perhaps E. coli as well. Uh, and in the environment of the, the work environment, not the greater environment, you would be looking at walls and floors and drains. OK, so you'd have a swabbing program in place. Uh, you would base it on, uh, you know, baseline it by doing some testing. Uh, if you find month after month uh, they're all negative, uh, you know, maybe you'd cut it back to doing it every three months. But you would have actions you take. They, there's some uh, positives in the drain. So we're going to we have a special sanitizer. We're going to increase the frequency or change our sanitation methods to try and uh, prevent this situation. So um, environmental protection plan, a very broad kind of question, but I would look upon it in terms of environmental swabbing. Now, I'm not talking about clean equipment swabbing to check the effectiveness of your uh, cleaning procedures. This is the environment in terms of the building environment in which you operate. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Monica, um, what would a food safety culture plan look like new requirement for brc issue eight yeah i think that's just too broad a thing to get into in in the the scope of what we're doing today so uh, i'm going to pass on that we can uh, dnv could probably give monica some guidance on that uh, under a separate forum yeah and we've also done other webinars so i might put a, a link to uh, one of the past webinars and to give some ideas for that yeah um, Okay, uh, John Edwards, although mentioned that non-conformance number is not a good objective, but what if the objective is, 
is to have fewer non-conformances than last year? Well, that's a great objective because remember one of the cornerstones of <clears throat> all of the standards is continual improvement. And of course, uh, how do we monitor continual improvement? One of the ways we do it is by looking at how many non-conformances did we have uh, compared to last year? Are we improving or for some reason, you know, going the exact opposite way that we don't want? So, yeah, I would say that's a very valid um, objective, you know, to monitor and track and, um, you know, show continual improvement in terms of fewer nonconformances. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, good. Uh, Clint, um, not sure about this one. Have you ever had dis a discrepancy when doing a first-party audit between food safety and upper management? Well, I'm not sure what they mean by first party audit in this instance. A first party audit is you're doing it for your own company, right? Second yeah. party, we're doing it uh, on behalf of a company. You know, example, I go out for ABC Ice Cream Company and check a dairy on their behalf. That becomes a second party audit. A third party audit is, um, you know, uh, the... Uh, body is, for example, BRC or FSSC, and, you know, the auditor goes in between the two parties. So have we ever had a discrepancy when doing a food safety audit? I think the question maybe means have we ever had kind of discord where upper management haven't agreed during an audit? And, yes, I mean, uh, we do get situations where people disagree, um, the sometimes the explanation is our team is very passionate. You know, we were very passionate about our job and our company. Well, I can counter that by saying, well, yes, I'm also very passionate and I try and be very professional. Uh, the key to not getting any kind of discord is to agree the findings as at the time you find them, in my opinion. And that's not to leave them all. And you go around the plant uh, everyone says, wow, what a nice guy this is. And then the closing meeting rolls around and everyone says, well, you know, there's five. No, you never told us that. You know, suddenly you're not a nice guy anymore. And everyone feels blindsided and disappointed. So uh, I try and focus on things which are uh, clear cut, not the ambiguous observation type situations that people can dispute easily. But um, I try and get agreement as we go along. Look at it. Do you see what I see? I give you an opportunity to explain it in case I've missed anything or misinterpreted anything. If not, hey, it's a nonconformance. And if you want to disagree at the closing meeting, that's fine. But the finding will stay and you have the right to appeal and it will go to the DMV technical department for appeal. And it can even escalate further if you're still unhappy with that. Yeah, just one thing on that, Don, you know, like just to expand yeah. on, on upper management, obviously senior management commitment uh, is vital. And one of the big gripes yeah. of a lot of quality in food safety managers is that it's sort of, it's your system, it's outsourced to you instead of being an integral company-wide thing. And they don't get enough support from either below peers or up above. I don't know whether you can say or not, but I mean, all roads lead to the top, you know, whether it's resources, uh, they haven't uh, painted the floor because mm -hmm. they haven't got the resources, they haven't put the overtime or the bought the paint or whatever. Obviously, there's more onus now and, and more auditable elements for scene management. Are you finding, what, what sort of things are you finding? Well, I think that's a great point. And if you go back a few years ago, Senior management tended to be very uninvolved. You know, they would uh, maybe come in the opening meeting and say a few nice words and they would tell you, of course, I don't think about this is here's my in the old days management representative. Right. Uh, uh, you know, if you're doing like a nine thousand one, he knows all about this or she knows all about this. I'm going to leave you with them and then uh, we'll see you at the closing meeting. Well, that doesn't cut it these days. You know, there has to be. Uh, demonstrable commitment from senior management. And it's not just uh, what is the commitment? Well, 
they have to have provided the resources to effectively have the food safety system operating. That's in terms of number of people and anything else they need, maybe test labs or test equipment. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to be looked at. The senior management, uh, I always try and interview the senior manager if he's not in the audit. Often they'll come and go during the audit. But I try and get some time, preferably on my own with the senior management or maybe two or three senior managers, so that they're not propped up by the food safety team who leap in and answer everything on their behalf. So uh, I also audit 9001. And of course, this is now if the senior management are not involved, you're going to have a fail. So I think it's a situation that's improved a lot over the last couple of years. And I see it continuing to improve, quite honestly, uh, Simon. OK, thank you for that, Don. Um yeah. I think the last question, we are 10 minutes over, actually, which is a bit naughty, but uh, it's so uh, so good. You know, it's so practical and, and to have an auditor is, is great. Uh, so we we'll just a couple more minutes and then we'll finish. Um, oh, thank you, Don and Simon. Have a great weekend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, highlight, I highlighted the wrong one. Uh, it should have been Ash K. You did uh, tell us the difference between critical, major and minor. But what about yeah. the difference between minor and observations? Well, an observation is really, you know, again, be careful not to soft grade because it's the favorite way of uh, you're trying to be a nice guy. And so it should have been a minor. I'll make it an observation. OK, be careful that it's not a way within the plant of circumventing your corrective action process because observations only need a correction. We don't have to do all that boring paperwork, right? So what is an observation? Although they're not formally allowed within FSSC, of course, I still see things which maybe raise a little bit of a flag, um, and but they're not quite serious enough to rate as a minor. So I will tell people, look, although we don't have an observation, this is something I'd like you to think about and maybe pay attention to, because if I come back next year uh, and it's still, you know, the control isn't good enough, it's uh, it could result in, in, in a minor nonconformance. It's a situation which is kind of worrying. And if it gets any worse, it could be a minor um, you're allowed to have observations within your own plant, however you like to manage your audit program. It's just that FSSC this year no longer allow them. Yeah, yeah. and someone's typed that area for improvement or opportunity for improvement could be an observation. Well, um, yes, of course, yeah. What, what, what would you do if uh, you went into a distillery and there were birds encircling inside the bottling area? What would you classify that as, <laughs> Don? A major. Yeah, Reynaldo Re said, would it be a major? Yeah. Yes, it uh, would. I mean, unfortunately, birds is a very, very uh, serious issue depending on uh, the type of product, you know, in cereals and grains and so on, uh, plants that crush um, soya or, you know, agricultural kind of related plants plants that deal um, perhaps in the fishing industry, uh, meat plants where there's lots of uh, waste. Birds is a very, very, very big problem. And of course, you know, the, you've got to come up with control measures. There's new methods where there's loudspeakers that with Pellegrine falcons squealing away in the background, trying to chase the birds away. And, you know, sometimes uh, they have a company that comes in with a permit and outside areas of the plant, they shoot birds at the weekend. I mean, in extreme cases. So, but what you cannot end up with is birds in the plant, feathers or bird poop. That most definitely will be a major. And depending on it, you could be heading into a critical. Mm. And uh, contrary to that, I was in France uh, last year in a big hypermarket, supermarket. And every time I went in, there were birds flying around everywhere and nobody seemed really bothered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say about that. No, no. Anyway, um, Penny, 
it's a very specific one to a, a process, but she just keep asking it. So how would tape on the bottom of tubs to make all tubs weigh zero before product is weighed in them be viewed in an audit? So, so they put tape on the bottom of tubs to make them weigh zero. So they're using it as like a processing <laughs> aid tape. Well, I'm not sure why you'd need to do that because usually, uh, you know, whatever weighing system you have, you would just set the tear for your empty tub. You should right? do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard of anyone sticking tape on a container to get it to weigh zero uh, before they fill it. I mean, no. do they then take the tape off? I mean, what kind of tape is it? You reuse yeah. the tape. The whole thing sounds absolutely fraught with problems. Uh, it's not normal practice at all. And I've got a feeling, you know, with the limited information there, if I were to see that, I'd probably have to say it's a non-conformance. Mm. You know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mario, what should I do in a cleaning validation if the machine doesn't clean internally? The endless screws cannot be removed to be cleaned. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, it's a bit like saying I'm going to clean my car and you go and get the engine hoist and tear the engine down to pieces. Um, again, most equipment, professional equipment, industry standard has been designed to tear it down to a level to allow you to sanitize it. Now, unless, you know, you've got some machine which has been locally made and it's not really sanitary design. This is the other thing. You have to look at your equipment and decide. I remove the covers. I remove the filler nozzles, for example, um, you know, the guide rails or something, which is designed for frequent strip down. It doesn't mean that I'm going to totally disassemble the thing. That's beyond the scope, usually, of the cleaning crew or the operators. So uh, I would be asking myself, why do I feel I need to do this, you know, tear down the normal parts, clean it, verify it by means of a visual inspection, a pre-op inspection. You can do clean equipment swabs and, you know, everything should just be fine. If it's not, you've got a problem with the hygienic design of that equipment. Okay, okay. And again, I think this is a similar thing. Amit, what, what is your view on the integrity of overhead fixtures above food contact service? surface we've had foreign matter recalls in meat plants so well, it's not good then well well again you know um anything which is above a food contact surface so you know i'm assuming an example of say a conveyor belt maybe it's moving i don't know chicken pieces from a spiral freezer over to uh uh, you know, a packing machine, putting them in bags or something like that. I mean, you have to look up and you have to see a clean, washable, sanitary surface. OK, if you, in fact, see a bunch of rusty, dirty pipes with dust on them, that's the answer to your question. You've got a problem. You know, it anything above. And I mean, I would encourage you don't have anything above other than a washable surface. You have to watch for condensation. You have to watch for dust buildup. All of those things must be thoroughly checked. And in fact, if there is risk of something falling from above, that should form part of your daily pre-op inspection before you start operations. You look at the plant equipment and you look at those environmental uh, aspects which you feel could be posing a risk. Okay. Really, this must be the final, final, final question. Mike Zachary, would cell phones in production areas be a minor nonconformance? Well, you know, that's a really good point because I repeatedly uh, get told, don't bring your cell phone in the plant, leave it in the office. You know, lo and behold, we get in the plant and everyone's got cell phones, the food safety team, and they're all taking photographs and so forth, you know. Um <clears throat> Look, the answer is certainly if you're an operator, you can't be handling food and then picking up your cell phone, right? Um, if you're the food safety team and you're not actually handling any product, you may, in fact, use your cell phone to photograph non-conforming uh, things you've found. And uh, I would just take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would hope the cell phone has some kind of um, 
screen cover on it so that if you dropped it, uh, you know, no fragments could possibly fall off. I know it's a bit of a long shot. These cell phones tend to crack rather than fragment. But uh, plant operators, absolutely no. Uh, management, yes, I would uh, accept that under, uh, you know, with uh, provisos. Great webinar. And lots of great practical information and um and and then the q and a as well superb um by don milne at d n v g l business assurance we'll definitely have to get uh, don on again in the future. I already loaded the uh certificate in the sidebar so you can download that type your name or sign it. Um, next week, we've got three easy steps and two tools for root cause analysis for your food safety management system with Vladimir Suchinsky. So, yeah, it's been great to have you with us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye.